Um, so if we could just get started, um, first of all, the reason I'm doing this moderation is um, they, 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 all these the average age here, average age here is 28, right? And so they thought, okay, how do we make the mayor comfortable in an environment where the average age is 28? We'll get the old Irish guy to interview him, right? So, so, so that's my, that, the only reason I'm here. Do you work in security here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. After this, it might be. Depends on the questions. We'll talk later. Um, the, um, the other thing is, is um, today's a holiday. Um, um, does anybody know the unofficial holiday today? The company success or can't answer this, but does anybody else know? Positivity Day. Today is uh, National Positivity Day. It's Positive Thinking Day. No negative thoughts. <laughs> so it's Positive Thinking Day. And, and the reason that day came about, it came about a few, uh, a few years ago, is there become, there's been various studies that say if you think positively, um, you're going to have better results and better efforts, right, with regards to things you're doing, whether it's in government, whether it's in work, whether it's in your life, right? And there's also been other studies. Uh, there, there's one that Globe just published that medically, people who think positively live longer lives, right? And, and, and accordingly, they created this day. And they created it because of the environment of today's world is si filled with so much negativity, right? And the mind, as a result of seeing that negativity, starts to think in a negative way. So even if you are like in a positive person, because your mind is exposed to so much negativity, your mind is conditioned to think negatively. And so what they found is that over time, if you, if you think positive, your mind can be reconditioned. So today's, th today's day was meant to focus on that, to, to, to recondition the mind. And so with that, I, I, you know, I, I, I get to, to moderate this, as I said. And I was thinking of the questions that I would ask the mayor, right? And I even started with, um, with a um, question of, okay, the first question would be, you know, um, you know, what can we improve in the city of Boston, right? But, but even that is negative, right? And then I asked some people in the hall, you know, what should I ask the mayor? Oh, can you ask him about the trash pickup on my street? Or, <laughs> or, or or the Molly wanted to know the security in West Roxbury is not that. I said, oh my God. And, and so I thought, no, we're not gonna do that, right? That, that we're gonna, all the questions today are, are, are gonna be positive questions, right? And so, so and the mayor, I, you, you see him on the news, right? He's always focused on, look, he's, get, he's taking his jacket off now, he's getting ready. <laughs> um, but he's always focused on, on answering negative questions, right? So today we're gonna to make it a positive day, right? And the objective is here for the mayor and his staff to leave thinking in a positive way, okay? Um, and so anybody who, at the end, if we have time for questions, if anybody's got a negative question, save it for later, okay? <laughs> um, or I'll give you a positive answer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'd like to start, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, everybody here knows a lot about David. Um, a lot of us know too much about David, to be honest. Um, but um, people here know about you from the press or the TV, right? And so I'd like to start with a little bit of a, a, of a personal question. Um, you know, you, you've accomplished a lot to date, you know, in your life and in, in the government and in the city of Austin. But it hasn't come without personal obstacles, right? And, and you've been very vocal about being a cancer survivor and uh, a recovering alcoholic and from addiction. But so uh, the, the question is, as you look at the qualities that you have as a person, what sort of have driven those, th those are things that in people's lives, or th most people don't encounter either of those, and you've encountered two of those traumatic events in your lives. What sort of inner quality has driven you to, to achieve the success that you have? Uh, first of all, th thank you for having me here today. It's exciting to be here. And as I walked in, uh, I couldn't help but notice everyone seems happy. Um, and I'm sure not everyone's happy, and this is positive day, so you need to be happy. Uh, but but uh, <laughs> it's amazing to see uh, so many uh, so much talent here in the city of Boston, uh, working in, in in basically the Copley area or downtown area. Um, and so thank you. And I know that many of you, uh, if I get to see a show of hands, how many of you are not from uh, Massachusetts originally? Yeah. See, um, how many of you are not from Boston? Or, not Boston or Massachusetts originally? How many from Boston? Really, three people from Boston. Okay, <laughs> we'll work on that. Um, that is, and, and I'm going off script. I'll come back to the question in a second. 
my focus when I became mayor in 2014 was exactly uh, the response to the first question, keeping young people here in the city of Boston. Um, what was happening is what's happened in the past is people get out educated here. They had a good time going to college here, and then they'd go to New York, Silicon Valley, or wherever you went. And now Boston is a real option. I'll come back to that later. Um, I think that the challenges you have as an individual shape you as you grow older. And it's what you do with those challenges as a human being on, on how you respond to them. So, for example, I had cancer at the age of seven, uh, Berkeley's lymphoma. Uh, I was told, I was, I wasn't told then, I was told, I found out later that I probably should have died. Um, the success rate of chemo and radiation at the time was 30%. It's like 95% today. Um, I didn't really think of it as a seven year old. You're not really thinking about dying. You just know you're sick and figuring it out. And you want to go play with your friends and stuff like that. And I couldn't do a lot of that stuff. Uh, but as I got older, I realized w what I had and the strength of me as a human being, uh, getting into recovery, uh, you know, um, being uh, love drinking, love beer, love booze, loved it all, loved the feeling. But somewhere along the line, um, that feeling of, of loving it uh, turned into almost having to have it uh, to drown out emotion, to drown out feelings. Alcohol is a depressant. So when, you, when you're in a bad space, whether it's a breakup or you, you think your life is awful and you're not going in a good way and you're drinking, it's not going to make you feel good. That initial first four or five, six beers, if you drink that many, that buzz, you feel good on it. But then the buzz goes away and then you start to get depressed again. So alcoholism for me, it was, it was kind of, um, you know, first it was fun drinking, then it wasn't so much fun anymore. And then towards the end, it was like disaster blackouts, not knowing what's going on, ruining relationships, ruining everything going on. Um, and going into recovery, I thought when I went to recovery, uh, my first night in detox, I went in there and I didn't go there to really stop drinking. I went there to get the heat off me because, you know, people were mad at me and everyone was upset with me. And um, I went in there the first night I was in there, uh, a group came in, Alcoholics Anonymous group, and they told their story. And one guy spoke. I don't know what he said. I forget what he said now. But I was like, whoa, wait a second. In my head, I got to really pay attention to what's going on here. Um, and I grew up a Catholic and I went to church every Sunday. I was an altar boy, all that stuff, but I never really had a relationship. So my counselor suggests I go in and say a prayer to somebody, anybody, grandparents, somebody just, I get down on my knees. And for the first time I got honest with myself and I asked, I asked a power greater than myself to help me, um, help me with something. And the rest of the week I was in detox. I, um, I listened, I listened to what was said. I took the suggestions I took, I learned about yet. Yet for me is drugs, and I didn't do drugs. I didn't pop Oxycontin. I didn't shoot heroin. I didn't smoke weed. I didn't do coke. I didn't smoke crack. But I know if I kept drinking, that that could be next. And I got out of there, and I started to I started to to work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And lo and behold, life got better. Um, day at a time, I was able to go back and apologize to the people that I hurt. Um, something that takes a burden off your chest. Many of us here, those of you that aren't alcoholics. You have a fight with somebody and you might have fought with somebody in college and you still didn't talk to them since college because they pissed you off because something happened. And meanwhile, that's wearing on you more than it is on them. And you're like, I'm really pissed about it. And you, you know, 30 years from now, you'll be talking, oh, that, my roommate was awful. And it really, it's about not, not necessarily forgiveness, but just getting off your chest. And that was part of, part of the program. Um, I think it's helped me be a person that, that I got into politics a year and a half after I got sober. I ran for state representative and, and I won. And um, I was fortunate enough to, to get in the business because I wanted to help people. That's, that's, why I got in the, that's why I'm in this business. I want to help people. I love helping people. I love helping disadvantaged people. I love sticking up for people that are being picked on. I just love it. It's just like one of those things. Um, I had a chance as a state representative to, to take some very, very controversial, difficult votes in death penalty in 1997 when I became the, the, the state rep. Um, there was a big ballot bill, whether to make the death penalty legal in Massachusetts. And and it was for the first time I really had an issue that I really, it was life and death that I, it was on, it could have been on, came down to one vote. I could have voted for the death penalty. It'd be the lot today. And, and it made me really think it kind of my first big grown up moment, although there was plenty of grown up moments, but it was my big first grown up moment. Uh, when marriage equality came around in 2004, it really wasn't that popular in my district. It was really wasn't that popular. And I, you know, when the Supreme court of Massachusetts said that gay marriage is legal, um, a friend of mine who's a state rep reached out to me. She was gay and she said, I need your support. I need a white Irish Catholic uh, straight guy to help me. And, um, and I said to myself, why would I not support gay marriage? It doesn't personally affect me, but it affects tens of thousands of people if, and millions around the country. But we were dealing with Massachusetts. 
So my point, I guess the qualities, I don't know, I'm only talking about the qualities I have, but I, I love helping people. I love sticking up for people. I love making life better for people. Um, all of those things that make me the person I am today, some of it came out of a negative experience. I know it's part National Positivity Day, but you take a negative experience or you take a tough challenge and you turn it into action into a positive manner. And I think that that's something that's really important. Um, I think for all of you here today, there's a lot of young people in the room. Um, I think, you know, I'm not telling you what you need to do. You're, you're, you're probably the, the smartest generation um, that we have had on this earth um, ever. Um, but I also think that there's some of the stuff that's come, it's come in different ways. And I think you have to go back to the grassroots in some ways. I mean, I know we have the smartphones and all the information is right there at your hand. But as I look around the room, as I walk through and I saw the books on the shelf, don't be afraid to take a book off the shelf once in a while and read it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to talk to people who came before you and talk about what's going on. Don't be afraid to give back. And don't be afraid. A friend of mine told me this. He's a court officer. Uh, he was a former court officer, Italian. Two of the most powerful words in the American, in, in, in the dictionary is, I'm sorry. Think about that for a minute. I'm sorry. And what that means is we all hurt each other all the time. And sometimes it takes the bigger person to apologize. And it, that, that, those words, I'm sorry, might not help the person you're saying it to. But for you and for me, it lifts off something out of my, out of my, my, my soul, I guess, or whatever it is that, that I feel better. Cool. That's very good. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that story. Let's turn a little bit to the, to the, to the city of Boston. And um, David, um, you weren't born here. Um, you did come here. Um, you have stayed here. Right? Um, uh, and people know a lot about you, but I'm not sure they know the, the reasons of, hey, why have you come? Why have you stayed? Many entrepreneurs come to make their money. And like the mayor said, they get back to California or they get back to where they came from. Like, uh, talk a little bit about, sure. about the, the basis of, of why you've stayed. Yeah, I wasn't born here. I was born in the Bronx, New York, uh, and then grew up in Queens. And then, you know, came to Boston. Uh, many, like many adventures start, I think all adventures start for the same reason, right? I did this big adventures, whether it's discovering countries or sailing across the seas, it's because you followed a woman, right? And so and this woman happened to be an Irish Catholic girl who grew up here. And so she wanted to move back. And that's how I got to Boston. And the first day that I was in Boston was the day that I moved here. I had never been to the city uh, because I thought I was going to move back in six months to New York. Well, she knew what you needed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they always do. Yeah. They always do. Uh, and so I came here. And the thing that <clears throat> stood out to me was a bunch of things. It was, it was a pretty different time. You know, it was almost 20 years ago now. So was, the city was pretty different than it is today. And but things that stood out to me were obviously quality of life, community. Uh, from a technology standpoint, it was it was a better environment than I was in in New York at the time, and uh, New York City and the Manhattan. And so like the universities, the vibrancy, the engineering kind of culture really stood out to me. And I found it easier to build a business here, and uh, in Boston, and continue to build businesses here than to build it in. New York City or in California or somewhere else. And so I've stood here this whole time through five companies now and uh, that I've started because of that vibrancy and because it continues to get better and the investment, I mean, it's almost unrecognizable even in the last 10 years, right? Yeah, cool. Now, <clears throat> like, like uh, Ms. Samir, um, a little bit like, like, like David, you and I also came here for women, right? You know, the, the woman was our mothers though, right? You know, as opposed to, to our, our fiancés or our wives, right? Um, so, so we don't have to go through that process. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we also know why you stay, right? If you're the mayor of the city, like, like you stay, right? Boyd, I mean, if you were the mayor of something, would you go? No, right? He's, I, the, I mean, he's the mayor of Nantucket. If, if I was the mayor of my, yeah. yeah. That's the mayor of Nantucket, yeah. mayor. Yeah. Right there. If I was the mayor of my house, I would never leave my house, to be honest, right? So, but, but, um, when you think about Boston and, and, um, Yo, you're in an elevator and, and, and somebody says, where are you from? I, I'm the mayor of Boston. And somebody looks at you like, uh, we have sales guys that look outside, at us sometimes with their head square, like they don't know what we're talking about. But if somebody says, I never heard of Boston. Like, like how do you describe the city? Um, for, I grew up here. I, uh, my mother and father from Ireland, so I'm a son of immigrants. Uh, they came here in the 50s uh, separately. They met here. Um, I grew up in Dorchester, which is, uh, uh, everyone knows it, part of Boston. Um, went to... Uh, Grammar school, uh, kindergarten and public school, grammar school at Catholic school, uh, Newman Prep High School, which is on Marlboro Street. The, the name of it, the prep was, it was a prep school, but not like the type of prep school that probably most of you went to. Um, 
I went to, uh, I was a horrible student, went to Quincy College. Um, after that, <clears throat> did notice I could do actually the work, transferred to Suffolk University, quit school uh, because I wanted to work construction and make money. I wanted to be successful. Um, eventually, and you know, the rest of the story is, we can get into it later. Um, how do I describe Boston? Boston is, is a city of neighborhoods. It's still a city of neighborhoods. Um, when I grew up, uh, it was a very different neighborhood, Phil. Uh, anyone live in Charlestown? All right, well, the Charlestown you're living in today is completely different than the Charlestown it was 30 years ago. <laughs> anyone living in Southie? All right, the is completely different, Southie, too. Uh, and then some of the other areas, they're all different, but those two areas I laugh because I'm, I'm watching people walking around with, with dogs and lattes and everything else. Like, that, was, <laughs> that wasn't happening 25 years ago. Um, but, um, you know, so, so I, I've watched Boston transition, and Boston has been a city that has transitioned its whole life, if you will. Um, immigrants and, and different immigrants in different waves from different places, uh, different power structures, the Brahmins and the Yankees and the Irish and the Italians. And, and now we have a lot of people of color moving into the areas of, of power, if you will, in the political spectrum in the business world. Um, Boston's identity, I think, in a lot of ways was, was a strong business community, but it was somewhat of a back office town. We did have some, you know, we, we kind of took credit for like Bank of Bank of America, which wasn't Bank of America, it was Bank Boston at one point, and then it became Bay Bank, I think, and Bay Bank of America, and it, it transitioned. Uh, Liberty Mutual, John Hancock Tower, that's kind of our pride of it. Um, the way I would explain Boston today is, is uh, I would start immediately by talking about the diversity of our city. Uh, I would talk about that 28% uh, of the residents that live in our city uh, are, are foreign born. 50% uh, of the residents of our city are people of color. 52% of the residents, the households in our city are led by women. I would talk about the strength of our diversity. I would talk about the strength of our, our universities and, 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 and the ability to, to attract people to our city. I think that that's important. Uh, I would talk about the importance of the companies that are here today, but not forget the companies that, that have been here for 50 years that have been the foundation for the company of the city. I would talk about the diversity of the city. The common theme is the diversity. When you think about Boston, I think about diversity in whatever, whatever aspect, whether it's business, whether it's tech, whether it's hospitals, whether it's, whether it's the, 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 uh, the you know, um, insurance companies, uh, the financial world. I, I would talk about the diversity of the city of Boston. That's kind of how I talk about it. I would talk about, too, you know, the uniqueness of the neighborhoods and how different they are and the ability to get around the city fairly quickly uh, that you can go to um, East Boston, live in East Boston, and you can be on the waterfront if you choose, or you can live in, uh, you know, Maverick Square, where you're two blocks on the waterfront, but you live in a community, or you can get on a train and go across the city to Dorchester and see something very different. I think that that's kind of how I would try and sell Boston. When a company comes to Boston, and, and they're in my office, or I'm going to them, uh, whether it's a company or a retailer, um, or let me just, so... Every year there's this big convention in Vegas that is these companies, uh, basically retail shops. They're fancy tea shops and fancy coffee shops and fancy ice cream shops. Apple's there and all the big shops are there. Uh, some golf shops. I go there and I talk about Boston. And I say, okay, this your, your idea of a unique green type of tea coffee program could work in and then talk about a specific area. Give an explanation of the area, define the area for them, and talk about the opportunities they have. And generally, it always comes back to the young people, it comes back to talent. It comes back to the talent we have because you're curious. You're curious. My generation, when I was 25 years old, we hung at, when well, I didn't hang at the corner, but we hung in the neighborhood. We went to the bar down the street, we went to the restaurant over across the street, we stayed in the neighborhood. You guys are curious. You go and explore. And I think the fact that this exploration is a strength for our city today. Uh, I view Boston, when I became mayor, I view Boston as a sports team. And we're competing with other cities around America. We're competing to keep the talents because we have the talents. We're competing to bring the companies in here because we want them to come to the city. And we started to think about how do we do that. And I think in the last five years, in particular since I've been mayor, we've done a pretty good job because of the show of hands. How many people in this room have been in the city within the last five years? Raise your hands. You think about that five years, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you were going somewhere else. And I know I'm not really answering the question you asked and I'm trying to, um, but, but that's, that's, it, yeah. it's, uh, that's, that's typical of all my questions. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. used, they're used to that. As a Bostonian, I just think like, we're the best, you know, 
We have Tom Brady. <laughs> In the Eagles. True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about economic development. We, you, you touched on it a little bit. Um, the, the, the one thing, I, I've been in tech industry 25, 30 years um, uh, here, uh, mainly based in Boston. Um, the one thing that has been frustrating um, for, for me or for the industry is that we've lost some big ones, right? And, and you know, if Zuckerberg was at Facebook, it was at Harvard when he invented Facebook, right? If, if he had done Facebook in the city, I think the city would be not completely different, but a lot different, right? And, and there'd be a lot of, uh, we've created great opportunities, but I think there'd, there'd be even more economic opportunity in the city. And we lost other things like, like um, Elias and David uh, know the guys from Dropbox, right? They were the MIT and went out there, right? Um, we've seen West Coast companies come in and buy East Coast companies, right? And, you know, East Coast venture or East Coast entrepreneurs are known for the, hey, I'll make the, uh, I, I won't run this game out long, right? I'll make the quick buck and then I'll get on, right? And I'll sell out, right? Um, that, that's not our game here. To be honest, it wasn't the game we had at, at the last uh, company that a lot of us were, were at. Um, but how, what is the city doing to, to sort of not only, I don't want to ask a negative question since I started out positive, but what, 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 what is the city doing to, to, to keep those kind of companies or attract those kind of environments? Well, first and foremost, I, th I think it's important for us to let people know that we are open for business and that we want your business here. And, and I think that I'll, I'll touch upon Facebook in a second. Um, when I first became the mayor, I, I asked a friend of mine, uh, who runs a venture capital fund to, to put a meeting together with VCs. And we sat in a room and we, went, we had a dinner down the street here at, at, at um, Capitol Grill. And I was going around the table and these were VCs that invested in everything from Uber to Lyft to, to everything. And, and, and I said, give me the layout of the area of VC spending and how it works. And basically what they said was the VC spending in Massachusetts and in Boston, we, pay, we give money to companies to start up and we let them go wherever they want. But the VC spending in California, in Silicon Valley, the money's given out in Silicon Valley and you're expected to stay in Silicon Valley. And I said, well, how do we change that image? And I, they, they started talking about how do we keep, th their response was we have to attract talent here. We have to think about keeping young people here. And we really have to create an ecosystem in the city of Boston that works for, for companies. And I left there seriously. And at the time, my chief of staff was 27 years old, Dan Coe. And, and I started talking about it because I'm like, Dan, you're a millennial. You have ideas. What do you think? And we started talking about what can we do for the perception of Boston, because a lot of it for you is perception. It's, it turns into reality when you live here, but it's perception. Boston's cool. Boston's fun. Great restaurants. Great scene. We like it here. Safe. You can walk around. So we thought about how do we use this an opportunity to market more opportunities to, 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 to keep young people here and to attract companies here. And in, since that time, I don't have the exact number on VC spending, but I can tell you VC spending for women companies is a huge success because the money's staying in the city of Boston. And women startup companies are coming here, investing here, starting here. WeWork comes in our front door. We start talking about WeWork expanding in Boston, opened up a space for them, uh, a maker space. They did that, uh, working with Mass Challenge. We created our own maker space within the Bolin building, a city of Boston space. Again, more, more inlets to, to attracting young people and keeping young people here. Um, we, we, it's ridiculous, but we, we change the laws. So if you, five years ago, if you wanted to have a glass of wine, on an outdoor patio, you had to go in there and you had to order food to have a glass of wine or a beer on an outdoor patio. And I'm like, that's crazy. Like, why do we have that law? What's that rule all about? And, and it was no reason for it. And, and we just made a simple change. Now, you didn't feel it and you don't see it. You don't even know what it's like. But five years ago, if you drank outside, you'd have to have, or eat food. It just doesn't make sense to me. Again, it, it's just things, little, little subtle changes that you, the approaches that you make here to attract people. Um, we went for the Olympics in 2014. Um, we went down to Redwood, California. We went in front of the USOC. I thought bringing Olympics to Boston would have been the coolest thing ever. Um, other people had other ideas about it, other thoughts about it didn't happen. But when we were down in Redwood, California, we, we, were, we were presenting to the United States Olympic Committee. And then after that, we had like four hours of free time before they made a decision. And Dan Cole, my chief of staff, was there. And I'm like, what should we do? And he said, let's go to Facebook. I'm like, let's go. We jump in the car, we go over to Facebook, uh -huh. knock on the door, uh, it's Mark home. Um, <laughs> who's, who's asking, the mayor of Boston and Dan Coach, chief of staff, um, but we saw the third person in line. He wasn't, he wasn't available, he wasn't on, on campus that day. And we, we got a tour of Facebook. 
and we got a tour of Instagram. And I said that day that if I were the mayor, when you moved out of Boston, you'd still be in Boston. And I laid down the foundation, the importance of seeing companies like that grow and expand in the city because they're such a large employer. And I do that all the time when I go different places to talk to people saying, if you're looking to expand companies that might've been here or someplace, we want you to expand to this, this to, to our place. I was out in, um, I was out in Seattle um, and I was at a startup out there and, and uh, their headquarters in Seattle. And I said, well, if you're looking to expand, we want you to come to Boston. Um, GE, um, General Electric, I was in my office one day, actually before that, uh, the, the, the um, real estate, head of real estate for GE, who happened to be in Boston. I met with him he, at the time. He happened to be from Ireland, so we had a great connection. And I said, well, if you guys ever like looking to expand, I want you to come to the city of Boston. Please like look me up. A year and a half later, I'm in my office. I walk in, I see on the book, GE looking to leave Connecticut. Well, what I do? I call the guy. He was no longer there. I call the person I knew and say, we're interested in GE coming to Boston. We're dead serious about it. <clears throat> that started the conversation. We had the conversation. It was Boston versus New York. We got the entire political world and people in the, in, in the educational world together, and we put on a presentation. And then when the time came, they chose Boston. Now, we know what's happened to GE since that time, and, but GE's been around for 100 plus years. They're going to rebound at some point. But the point of it is GE's global headquarters is in the city of Boston. And what happened was companies started to say, I want to be in Boston. If GE moved to Boston, something must be going on. And it's not just the big companies. It's companies like this, that when you started here, we talked on stairs out in the hallway, 60 employees, I think 300 now, and, and what, however many more, that, you know, you're, you're here. And so it's so important. So I guess the, 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 the thing that's important is, is how do you, just like all of you, when you pick up a sweatshirt that has drift on it and you go out and you walk through the streets of Boston on it, people don't know what, some, most people, what, what's drift? You have an opportunity to market your company. You have an opportunity to market the work that you do as an individual. So what I do in the elevator is when I talk about being the mayor of Boston, I use that opportunity to market the city that I love, the city that I want to be the most successful city in America. And I, I take whatever that opening is and run with it. Cool. That's nice. David. Following on that, right? The the government, the city, and the state can only do so many things, right? And and one of the I think cool things about San Francisco is there's an infrastructure there, and the infrastructure are guys and 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 gals that are CEOs like you and founders like you and Elias, right? What what um what do you see as opportunity with regards to build that infrastructure? Because there's a bit of a community around that of how you can help one another out, right? And, and what, is, what are some of the venture guys doing or what are some of you guys doing as executives and founders to help, to help drive that? Sure. I think, you know, I would say that I've been trying to answer this question probably the last decade, you know, since like the, um, from, mostly from the venture side, people in venture side asking me. But I agree with the mayor a lot. I think, you know, the, the Boston of 10 years ago, very different place. Boston in five years is a very different place. And a lot of what we need to do is actually, from the infrastructure standpoint, it's pretty simple. It's marketing, which is to your point. And I think some of the stuff that you've been doing on livability, which I think those small, subtle changes, we don't think about. We want these big paradigm changes, and it's those small things. Like, you know, five years ago, the, you know, you'd be wondering, where do you hang out here? Where do you go? Where are there people? Where can I find action? Five years ago, the seaport didn't exist right? Literally didn't exist. I mean, I just remember trucks being there for most of my time. You go there, now it's vibrant and all the work that you've been doing there, it's vibrant, it's happening. People come in from out of town and see that and they say this is a happening place. Or even small things like, you know, outside patio, uh, how come I can't buy a beer on Sunday? Like all these small things like wear on you as a person coming in here. I know when I moved to Boston, it was all of these small little rules that didn't exist in New York that I didn't understand. And as if you're coming here as a 22 year old, 23 year old, these things kind of wear on you, right? You didn't grow up with these things. So I think there's small things that we can do like that. Marketing is the number one thing. And so I spend time at, uh, in Cambridge and at HBS kind of helping on that end. And then at Sloan as well, because I think those two schools are powerhouses. We have many more schools, but those are the ones that I spend time at. And I think they're probably super lousy, which I tell them at marketing, right? They're not as good as marketing uh, from a marketing standpoint as Stanford is in, in San Francisco. And a lot of things that have happened in Silicon Valley have to do with a lot of the marketing that Stanford and the business school has done there. We've been poor at kind of trumpeting our own work here. And I, I like the work that the city is doing and that Mayor Walsh is doing now to actually market, right? I think that was like a dirty word probably like five, 10 years ago. 
in Boston. That wasn't a Boston trait to actually uh, pump our chest, but we've won a lot of Super Bowls and a lot of rings now, and so I think we can, we can uh, <laughs> pump our chest. I like how you say we. Um, <laughs> uh, let me just w- one point on, on, on HBS. Um, I went over to HBS when, when I was a kid growing up. That, that, I didn't even know what HBS was. Uh, my family wasn't tied into the Harvard or business school. It just it wasn't an option. Um, but when I became the mayor, um, my chief of staff, Dan Coe, was HBS. And I had a chance to go. I just watched the way he was prepared. And I, I looked at some fellows that we had in our office, the former HBS fellows that were in our office. And I'm thinking, wow, these, these, these kids, these people think differently. And I went over to HBS and, and I sat in on a class and, and uh, they did a presentation for, 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 for our team. And I, I, was paying, I was thinking about the way that they train somebody and, and to think differently and think critically and, and really do some amazing things. So afterwards I asked, I asked uh, the, the dean, can you find out for me what percentage of H- HBS grads stay in Boston? And so we did, 5%. So we went back to the office. I'm saying to Dan Co, we let 95% of some of the best and brightest talented people come to our city or Harvard, the next door in Cambridge. Well, they actually it's in Boston, and leave. And how can we do a better job of keeping that base of brain power in the city of Boston? And I think the colleges that you all go to, that one two here in Boston, those of you who came here to college and stayed, they're doing a, a better job. And companies are starting to realize now. We should go to Northeast and we should go to Boston College, we should go to BU, we should go to Harvard and try and recruit people here. But some of the higher level education stuff isn't necessarily happening, still not happening. And whether that's a marketing thing on HBS's point or my point, we have to do more of that. Because again, there's so many bright people uh, in the world that, that we have to try and, and, and keep here in the city. And I think a lot of it that I see you know, on the campuses is marketing because I talk to them about I'm talking about options and where they should go. And they're talking about companies. And I mentioned local companies and they're like, what's that? I didn't know, where is that? I didn't know that was here, right? And those are companies that are here. But for a long time, probably the last 20 years, those companies outside of Boston have done a better job of marketing to those students than we have, right? No question about it. And, 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 that, and again, it's, it's, that's not all about government. That's about work. That's a collaboration yep. with business. Yep. Uh, and, and I shouldn't be out there marketing Boston by itself. I need to get CEOs and, and investors and people say, wow, Boston is an option. Yeah. And I think today we're probably in a better position than we've ever been to really have this good, strong foundation about moving forward. Great. Great. Let's talk about, um, you talked on it earlier, culture and diversity, right? It, it's a, um, a big focus of us in the company. I, I think Drift is very unique in that both the two founders, David and, and Elias, Elias actually dress up today. Usually he wears these cut off jeans and stuff, but, yeah. but today... <laughs> <laughs> today he today he's dressed up not for me but it must be for you mr mayor but <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. That's all right yeah I, I asked him to paint my cubicle yesterday because he looked like a painter yeah. but um he said he wouldn't qualify as a landscape but he had to work his way up but they're they're both uh, they're both underrepresented minorities right I, I think we are unique in the city of boston that that if if we're not the only um tech startup with two founders that are that are underrepresented we are certainly the biggest and the most successful uh, that, that are. Um, and so a big part of our focus and, and their focus, and, and, and you can see it in the, in the faces out here, is how do we become, Elias calls it the corporate face of America, right? We want to be the most diverse company um, uh, in the city of Boston. And we, we just hired, Dina Upton runs, um, runs our people organization. She just hired a director of diversity and inclusion. Um, we're, we're got all sorts of internal efforts going on to do that. What are some of the things that the city is doing? You alluded to them earlier, but some of the yep. things the city is doing to help that, that inner city get into the tech industry. I, I think, first of all, talk about who we are as a city and about our identity and, and don't run away from it. And I mean by that is when I talk about, when I give you the breakdown of the city of Boston, it's a true breakdown. We have 700,000 people that live in Boston proper, 20% foreign born, 50% people of color, 52% households led by women, which means that the impact, the economic impacts are, v- are vital to having success in, in the different demographic areas I just talked about. Um, we have, we are very focused on pay equity for women, um, not just talking about it and passing legislation. You know, I, I remember in 97 voting on a piece of legislation. Some of you probably weren't even born then or you're in first grade. And, 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 I, and we're fighting about pay equity in 97. We passed legislation. It's going to solve it. And here we are, fast forward 22 years later, 22 years later, and 
a white woman gets paid, I think, 71 cents on the dollar to a man, a white man. A black woman gets paid 63 cents on the dollar to a white man. And a Latino woman gets paid 51 cents on the dollar to a man. I mean, so we, we, we're not there yet. So we we working with companies like Drift, and thank you for signing on to the Talent Compact, getting data anonymously from companies, 260 or 50 companies, 50 or 60 companies now, that are giving us data anonymously on pay, what they pay their employees. And we're looking at do, that and doing breakdowns to see if where the pay equity still stands. Working to force companies, me as the mayor talking publicly, to force companies to make sure that women and Latinos and black people and Asian people are on your boards and part of your leadership teams and part of your, your hierarchy, making sure that in my own administration, the city, that, that it reflects the city because I can't go out and, and demand or expect companies to do, follow if we're not doing it. So looking at those different areas, creating opportunities. One thing that all of you can do in this room, it might not help drift today, but 10, 15 years from now, is mentor a young person. Find a young person in the city of Boston that needs mentorship and explain to them and help them through that. I think that those, those are key important things that you can do and, and take your, some of your free time if you haven't, even if it's an hour a week or two hours a week, just doing things like that. But I think that you know, working with companies, having companies that that's their mission to be the most diverse in Boston and letting people know that's your mission so that you're challenging other companies to do the same thing. In private settings, don't be afraid to call people out and call companies out and say, Yo, it doesn't appear that way. John Hancock, just uh, for the first time in the history of the company, uh, the, the CFO is a, is, a, is a woman. You know, um, she worked her way through the company, did an incredible job, but I'm sure they said it's time. It's time. And I think that a lot of those different places, a lot of those different things we have to do, we have to continue to, to, to move. You look at the, if you read the paper, you listen to the guys in the White House, I mean, the message, the message is so negative all the time. That's not so who we are. This is positive, Dave. That's, and I'm, tra I'm turning into yeah. it. That's not who we are as a country. Don't talk to Mr. Trump. Even though it feels like it is, <laughs> it's not who we are as a country. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us, one person at a time, all of us in this room, to continue to reach out there and do what we need to do. It's great when you have, a, when you have the, the, the heads of a company willing to have, have the, that mission. But spread that mission to other companies. You are the ambassadors, not just of this, of this, of this company. You're the ambassadors of talking about diversity and inclusion. And when you're out at a bar and you bump into somebody that works at, you know, wherever they work at, you talk about what the philosophy of your company is. So they'll take that back to their company and say, you know, I was at a bar the other night. We're talking to some people over at Drift. This is what they're doing over there. We should be thinking about this too. And now we're getting, now we're getting more and more people in the conversation. You can't run away from it. When, when we one of the most difficult conversations to have is, is about racism. And when I became the mayor, it's a conversation I had more and more of. And when I was running for mayor, I would talk about racism as like, you know, we're working on racism. In, in the city of Boston, we want to we wanna make sure there's no racism in the city of Boston. And, you know, we just kind of soften because we don't know how to t talk about the issue. Um, it's important to talk about the issue because it's a positive thing to talk about it. You're talking about a negative past, but you're talking about making a positive future, if you will. Cool. David, a little bit, let's follow on on that, um, on the, the topic of diversity and, and, and culture. I, um, you and Elise are doing a lot of stuff, right? And, and we're trying to do a lot of stuff as, as an individual company, right? We participate in being uh, the team build, we do the hack diversity, we're in the mayor's um, city program, uh, summer kids program. But, but how can we as a company, and maybe it's some of the things that Mayor talked about, but engage those other tech companies? Because it's, it's, it's almost, we can't win that battle by ourselves, right? It, it, it's too big a battle. But how can we engage other tech companies or other venture companies um, to, to help us do that? I think we take uh, two approaches. One is marketing, which we're good at. So we try to market what we're doing. and uh, And people around us and companies around us and venture funds around us see that. And the other is what the mayor said, which is to call people out, to hold them to task, to, to challenge them to do similar things. And for us, you know, it's very important. It's uh, we, Elias and I, really focus on, and as a company, we are really two areas, which is, you know, helping underrepresented minorities, which we are both of, and then helping single mothers, which we were both raised by single mothers. So those are two things that are not only professionally important, but personally important to us. And we started uh, from the very, from early on this idea of this Drift Foundation where we're gonna pour our energy 
into those areas and specifically into taking an approach that is a generational approach because this, as you mentioned, is not a simple thing. This is not a hashtag. This is not a quick fix kind of thing. This is going to take a generation, a multi, multiple generations. So we invest mostly in kids, right? In both of those areas, kids who are being raised by single moms or kids who are underrepresented minorities to bring them to STEM and tech. And uh, whether it's in elementary school, junior high, high school, versus just focusing on you know, college and people just about to graduate because those people have already self-selected into those programs by then. You really have to go back to the earlier and younger people. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a big mission and hard to sell because you, everyone wants a quick fix, but we need to take this kind of generational approach. I, I also think, uh, Mr. Mayor, that, that the way the city has changed over even the last five or six years creates more of an opportunity for companies to do that. Because I'll take the, the last company I was at, our, our headquarters was out in, in Woburn, Massachusetts. And we were also big into the, how do we create a diverse population here? And, and we had an idea of, okay, um, um, you know, let's, let's, let's get a bus. And we were in an industrial, we were, there were five or six other tech companies there. We were in the mode of, Let's, let's, hey, rent a bus for summer. Let's have somebody drive that bus, pick these kids up in, in uh, the city of Austin and drive them out to, to Ruben, Massachusetts to get them into the tech industry. But, but the hurdles in which to do that, like, were too much, right? And so to get into the Burbia. But now what's happened is with these companies coming into the city, right, these kids can, okay, get on a bus themselves and show up in the seaport, get on, a, get on the subway and show up here in Copley Square where five, six years ago, you did not have that kind of tech industry here. So I think it creates more an avenue and an easier avenue for us to, to achieve some of those goals. And you also fi got to find the kids. I mean, uh, you know, uh, my father was a construction worker. I was a construction worker. I wanted to wear a suit and tie and get business cards. I don't know what that meant, but I knew back then that's what I wanted to do. Um, obstacles and challenges came up that threw me off the path. I eventually got back on path. Um, I got the office, I got the business cards, I got the job I wanted to do. Um, and and, and it, it's, it's almost like you want to, you, you need to experience. And the reason why I wanted, I saw my uncle work in an office. I saw him wear a tie. I'm like, well, that's interesting. And he, I saw him representing people. I'm like, oh, I kind of like that. And that kind of gave me incentive to kind of push myself to become something, nothing wrong with construction workers. They're great. I love them. They build these buildings and they knock them down. They build them back up again. <laughs> but, but, but it's like, it's like giving people an uh, experience. There's so many young kids in, in urban America today that, that have no idea what tech means. They have no idea what startups means. They have no idea what, what an opportunity means. Some of you probably, when you went to college, your first year in college, you had no idea what a tech startup was. And all of a sudden, you stumbled across it over the next couple of years because the, the industry kind of boom, uh, blew up. Um, how, how do we expose young people to positive situations? How do we expose them to, 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 to positive experiences? And that's why... I think it's so important that for all of you, some of you, most of you, whoever wants to mentor young people and, and give them the opportunity because some kids have grown up in uh, generational poverty, um, you know, and, and it's not their fault and it's not their parents' fault and it's not their grandparents' fault and it's not their great-grandparents' fault. It's just that that's just what's happened. And, and I think that there is a chance. There is probably somebody in this room that can go back and say, you know, I grew up in generational poverty. My grand, my, my mother was poor. My my grandmother was poor, my great grandmother was poor, but now I'm here. I have a real opportunity, and, and that's just by getting somebody opening a door a little bit and letting somebody experience something. That's also key. Cool. Yeah, I love that answer because I think modeling is so important, right? Being able to see this and see this happen. So many people that I talk to about, including myself, about how did you get into what you're doing? It was happenstance, just like that. You had an uncle, you had a job, you saw someone one day, and you're like, oh, what is that? I can do that right? You know, I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to have a business card just like you, but I didn't know what business meant, right? Uh, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurism wasn't a word until recently that I knew, right? Although, um, and so I didn't know any of that and I wanted to model. And then my mom's dream was that I wear a suit, but I failed that suit, that, that dream, right? And she was our parents' dream. Yeah, right? You know, they exactly. didn't want me wearing construction. They wanted me wearing a suit and a tie. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'll put a suit and tie on every day. Yeah. Now I want to wear ripped jeans and t-shirt. <laughs> totally. Like Elias. Yeah. <laughs> How about, um, uh, you may have seen it as you, as you walked around here, but um, Elias and David have created a culture, we call it a culture of learning, right? And, and 
you see it in the books around here. And the, the strategy is, look, um, we don't have to invent everything, that there are a lot of great companies that have gone before us that have invented things, right? Um, whether it be Amazon, whether it be Walmart, whether it be Home Depot. And we, I wouldn't say we study them, but we emulate them in some ways, right? As you look out into, you know, your profession, is there a city in America where you also learn from? And, and do you have that concept or that strategy? I think as, as, as a leader or as a city, you always have to learn and evolve. And I think that there's not one city that I look at and say, oh, my God, I love everything that they're doing over here. Um, you take bits and pieces from everywhere and, and you, you, in, you incorporate them into, into the government. You incorporate them into society. Even as an individual, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was watching last night a clip on YouTube. My brother sent to me of Lou Holtz giving a speech at a, at a graduation. I don't know if anyone's looked up. Just look it up. It's, 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 it's yeah. so like, inspiring. Yeah. And I'm thinking, like, I got to remember every single word he said and just repeat this when I talk to <laughs> the way because you're just amazing. And I realized that I can't do that. Yeah. But what I can do is, is take bits and pieces of his message and, and incorporate, first of all, in my life so that I believe in what he's saying and then pass that message along to someone else. And I think that part of that is by experiencing. So, for example, we have what's called the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and we meet twice a year basically uh once on a on a on a um uh, a june meeting two years ago it was in boston uh this year unfortunately it was a horrible place we had to have the meeting it was in hawaii and um <laughs> and we go to dc and what we do is we share best practices and we talk about situations so uh and, and and so when i'm watching tv and i see riots happening in baltimore and i see the mayor of baltimore standing at a podium by herself I call her up and I say to her, you need to put some people around you. You need to take a deep breath. You need to get ahead of the situation and you need to work forward. And how did I know that? I knew that by listening to somebody else telling me the story. So sometimes I offer advice to other cities or, or I'll call Michael Nutto when he was the mayor of Philly and say, listen, I'm dealing with some issues around race in Boston as an African-American mayor of a, of a major city. Can you give me some advice on, on maybe how to handle this thing uh, on complicated issues? And we kind of, so we share best practices, if you will. Cool. Um, you know, I, I don't think, it, you know, you, you don't want to just, I don't want to just copy one city because then we become that city and it's like, we want, you want your own identity, just like your company. You don't want to say everything Home Depot does, we're going to do because it's great. And, and you're just Home Depot and, and you want to be Drift and I want to be Boston. And it's important for us to think about how do we, yeah. how do we improve yeah. it? David, you want to follow on that for good because, you know, uh, while we've talked this, about the story a lot to employees, we do have a lot of new employees here, right? But the whole idea of, of why you guys adopted that and the strategy sure. around. I think part of it is uh, similar to the mayor. It's kind of uh, experience or age will teach you that the bits and pieces are there, right? You just have to be smart enough to look for the right bits and pieces and assemble them. And I think too early in life you get, um, and I don't know, for me, it seemed like in school I was taught to just like, that that would be cheating, right? That that was cheating, plagiarism, that you don't want to copy, that you had to be wholesale original, at least back in my day. And I think that's a poor lesson to teach, right? Like the patterns are there because they're human patterns, right? That's why they repeat. And so uh, I'd say the first uh, half of my career, I didn't do that. I didn't look for the bits and pieces. I learned only one way through pain, aka brute force, right? So I learned everything the hard way myself and then uh, switched over time. Some would call that wisdom or maybe you just, I didn't want the pain anymore and uh, started to learn bits and pieces from those who came before us. And you start to see history repeats. It, it repeats in different ways, but that the lessons are there because they are human lessons. They are not business lessons. They are not civic lessons. They are human lessons. They are personal lessons. And because we are humans at the end of the day, and we act in certain ways. And so for us, it's become very important to learn from others and emulate and uh, to look back in history and to build upon those shoulders of those people that have come before us. Final question, then we'll, we, we'll probably have time to take a couple from the audience. But, but we, we have, Mr. Mayor, we have roughly 240 employees here. I think I told you on the way in, average age is, is 28. Um, myself certainly takes that dramatically up. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and Paul, the auditor over there, also takes that up dramatically. But, but other than that, the, um, it's a very young population. Um, as you saw, it's a lot of people that live in the city, too. Um, how can they, they're, they're, they're young, they're passionate, they're smart, most of them anyway. Um, uh, how, how, how can they help? How can they help you? How can they help the city? How can they help you guys and gals accomplish the, what, what you guys want to do? 
Um, first of all, be happy what you do every day. Uh, honestly, you want to love and be passionate about your job. Um, that's number one. I think that, that working for a company or working for government, if you're disgruntled or not happy, that, then you're doing yourself a disservice and you're not helping the company. I think number one, that's one thing I do. Uh, number two, don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to get back. What does that mean? That means get involved in your civic association. That means get involved in mentoring somebody. That means get involved in something. Just, just you are part of Boston's fabric now. Now, whether or not you're here 25 years from now, you might be, some of you might be, some of you might not be, but be part of this community because this is a special community and, and be active out there. I think that that's, that's an important aspect of it. Um, you know, if, if this is completely off topic a little bit, but if, if, when I talked about being uh, alcoholic, uh, if you're out here and you're struggling, ask, some, try, ask somebody for help. Um, just don't, because what happens is that'll save you a lot of pain in, in, your, in you and your family. If you don't have a family, your future family down the road, just reach out your hand and talk to somebody. I think that's important. Don't be afraid to say, I'm sorry. And, and don't be afraid, to, and don't be afraid to, to offer help to people. I think those are just basic. It's, it's like a parent now. I don't mean to, but it, it, those are all things that, that it, 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 you're old enough now to realize. There's no really young people. That, what's he talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Um, push government. Vote. Get active. Have your voices heard. You know, let, let people know. Don't, don't think that your vote doesn't count. Your vote absolutely counts. I don't know how many people are registered to vote here. Um, if you want to raise your hand, how many registered to vote here? Okay. And I'm not going to ask you how many people vote because most hands won't go up. You're going to say, well, I voted, I voted against Trump in 2016. Yeah, well, that's one presidential election. There's a city council race now. You need to get active in, in, in society. That's important. Um, you know, th these are all things that, that I would suggest you do. Uh, and there's so much more I'd suggest you do. Uh, but I, I just think to just be honest to yourself. I, um, I worked for the labor's union. Uh, I was in an office. I had a tie on. Um, I made a good, pretty good check back in 1996 after I got sober. Uh, I had a car. I had a gas card. I didn't pay for my insurance. Um, it was pretty cool, pretty sweet gig at the time. Um, I was miserable because I didn't want to be there because I, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to be, do something that was fulfilling to me. When, I, when, when the state representative who was in my area decided not to run again, uh, it was October of 96. I went home, told my mother and father, I said, I'm running for state representative. My father was very happy that I had a good job and consistent job and pension, all this stuff. He said, I think you're making a mistake. My mother said, I don't want you to run. My uncle came over. We ran the union at the time said, you're making a big mistake. And I said, no, no, I, I want to do this. And I ran and I got elected and I got paid less. And for 16 years, I was happy. In 2011, I was a state representative and I had the opportunity to take over the building trades. And I did. So I was a state rep and building, ran the building trades in Boston. I made a lot more money. First time in my life that I had actually two checks that I uncashed. And two years later, the mayor decided not to run again. And I was saying, okay, I can make $250,000, $300,000 a year combined over here with an incredible pension, work for 20 years, retire, make more money, retire because I have a pension from the laborers, a pension from the building trades, a pension from the state, and I'm happy. But you know something? I'd be miserable. I wanted to be mayor, so I ran for mayor. And I think that you follow what's in your heart. You follow the dream that's in your heart. That's the message I have for the young people in this room. Follow that heart because that heart will take you where you want to go. If these two guys didn't do what they did, they didn't follow their heart, they wouldn't be sitting here as CEO. They might be working for a startup company, but they took a gamble. And that gamble, I wouldn't say necessarily paid off. It's not, life isn't over yet, but... It's, it's, it's something changing. You're changing the culture of the city of Boston. So that's what I would do. Cool.